This is the third discourse on the emergence of cultism in the West. Um, and we'll be looking at some other traits of this particular cult and how they resemble other cults um, within Islam and beyond Islam. But before getting into that, I'll address a message that came out from Dr. Abdulillah Lahmami on the 15th of September, which was a rather naive, spurious statement. Um, not the statement in itself, but why he put this message out. Because he stated, Salafia is not a cult. Who said it was? We agree entirely with that statement. Salafia is not a cult. We are talking about the cult you belong to, Dr. Abdulillah, and your colleagues, the Salafi publications, Maktaba Salafia cult and its cult followers. So yes, we agree with you on that. Salafia is not a cult. But the reason for making this statement, we need to look at the impetus behind it. And it's something that many of us as Salafis let slip. And it's when this cult tried to claim ownership for Salafia as though they are the true and only Salafis. So when they were being criticized over the past two decades as it increased and as the crescendo got louder, they would go to their scholars and they would use this phrase, the Salafis are being attacked. They are attacking the Salafis. So the inference would be that those who were criticizing or attacking the Salafis were non-Salafi and that in actuality, they were the only Salafis. So the response that started coming back from the scholars who are innocent and unsuspecting of the machinations of individuals when they come to them, they would respond in a manner that was addressing non-Salafis, when in actuality, it was fellow Salafis who were addressing and criticizing and in inverted commas, attacking this cult. So Abdulillah, again, it is agreed, Salafia is not a cult. Okay, I've said that three, four times now, but your statement is said for a reason, okay? And you're really trying to stretch the issue. It reminds me of Malcolm X, Malik al-Shabazz, rahimahullah, and his analogy of the house Negro. Because the house Negro, when his master was sick, the house Negro would say, are we sick? So now the cult's being attacked and you have to stand up and you have to attribute the attack of your cult and try and align it to Salafia. And the master in this instance, just so we're clear, everyone, is the cult leaders, not the scholars that they adhere and refer to. The cult leaders resident in the UK and their cohorts in America and elsewhere. So I think I've addressed that. Um, Abdulillah's deference to the cult is akin to the house Negro that Malcolm X describes. It's unfortunate, but the cult has many lackeys. Some of them here in Saudi Arabia have graduated from Medina and elsewhere. Moving back to this topic in its specific nature, and I, I'll refer to my research again. And there was a theoretical framework that I developed and adapted from another science altogether. And I've called it the life cycle of uh, Muslims post-religious cognitive process. So for example, when a Muslim starts practicing again, for example, or Let's look in this particular specific framework when an individual embraces Salafia. They come in at one of four stages, a founding stage. OK, that's a very uh, idealistic and simplistic stage of development. They then proceed on to the youthful, more formative phase. Now, these first two phases are actually very idealistic, very vulnerable phases where dependence is on their teachers. So if we just run a parallel very quickly now and we look at the Kharaji Takfiri um, type of propaganda, and we're not saying this about this cult, they're, they're, they're within the Salafi framework, 
inshallah. But when we look at the takfiri um, cults, what they do at the founding and youthful phase is they imbue and indoctrinate their followers with politics, a politicized, emotional understanding of the deen. This is where Tawheed al hakamiyah comes in, where they start talking about the hukam, where they start disrespecting the rulers and everything like that. Now, that's what the takfiri kharijis do. And again, I reiterate, this cult doesn't do that. They're not ideologically extreme in that way, as I said in my first discourse, part one. However, what they do is at this founding phase and the youthful phase, they start instilling in these individuals resentment to other Salafis, warning against other Salafis, warning against scholars, getting these new Salafi reverts, converts, whatever you want at this founding and youthful phase, these two early stages, vulnerable stages of development, they get them at this stage and they start talking to, to them about not going to this masjid, that masjid, stay away from this individual. And what you'll see is they only direct them to their literature, their so-called sheikhs, their charismatic cult leaders, their products, and yes, even their complementary medicine products and things like this from Dr. Amjad Rafiq. So what we see is that there's a, a direction and a gearing towards everything of that cult. That's the first thing. What needs to happen, and we see it happening increasingly and from what's been taking place over the last few months and hopefully years, um, when more people are hearing from our brothers in America, are hearing from brothers in the UK, people who are speaking about this cult, okay? These individuals are moving from the first two phases. Remember the founding phase and the youthful phase, the very idealistic phases where there's a lot of dependency on individuals and people to give you information and knowledge and everything. They move to the third phase, the adult phase, where they start reviewing and understanding the foundational aspects of Tawheed, of Sunnah, of the place of the scholars in Islam, and to discern if someone is giving them rhetoric or not. They move to the adult phase, and that's through lived experiences. We see a lot of broken communities, for example. We see a lot of broken friendships, broken marriages. That's not all down to the cult. We can't blame them. That would be unjust, and that's the one thing that is not going to come from this side when we're talking in this manner. We're not going to throw abuse, rude names, and mock Twitter signs up and everything like that. We're going to give the evidence as we know it in, uh, in the, the most balanced of way, inshallah. So what happens is at that adult phase, many experiences, many practicalities come through and these individuals reflect upon their way of learning from before. So there was that idealism from before, there was that enthusiasm before, but now they're looking and balancing and realizing, like many of them have done, like many of those who were in Jamia Ihya Min Danish Sunnah in the early 90s to mid 90s, Jimas realized that was a hizb. It wasn't a cult. It was a hizb, which is different. OK, but they realized and they progressed beyond that. However, then we saw this oasis Maktaba Salafia cult come up and they continued for those who were susceptible and vulnerable to it. So they get to the adult phase, they review and they start moving away from these cultish tendencies. The ideal area to re reach, and, and inshallah, many of us are moving in that direction or will move in that direction, is the fourth stage, which is the mature, reflective phase, the mature phase. So these later two stages, the latter two phases, adult and mature, are when the individual is really aware of how he or she may have been duped in their first earlier stages because of their enthusiasm. Because of their, their enthusiasm, their lack of understanding, their lack of knowledge, their love of cults, their cult personalities, being enamoured with the speech, and because they may have come away from being a Diabandi, a Sufi, they may have been non-Muslim, and they've come to what they see is the truth, and Salafia is the truth, but they went in the direction of a cult instead. And so the Dr. Abu Iyad, and I'll refer to him as doctor, I have to give him respect because of his PhD credentials, before he comes back about social sciences, which I'm going to touch upon in a little bit later as well. When we look from the Dean perspective, there is something, and the Dean is obviously the crowning and foundational reference point that we need to go to. 
we see that the theoretical framework that I tested and applied in my research um, can be aligned with the deen in the hadith that we see here from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, who said that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, for every action, there is a period of enthusiasm or activity. And for every period of enthusiasm or activity, there is a period of rest or inactivity. So he whose period of rest or inactivity is in accordance with my sunnah, then he is rightly guided. But he whose period of rest accords with other than this, then he is destroyed. And this was narrated in Ahmed. So we see here that those earlier stages of that enthusiasm, that activity, if it was in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, then is rightly guided. So we need to look at the cultish behavior and what's happened with the fruits of the cult and the individuals who were at this stage. And many individuals, many of us, it may be not in this particular stage or in this particular, um, under uh, being a, a Salafi, we may have come from other walks of life or other um, uh, schools of thought where we were basically showing this excessiveness, this idealism that was there. So these four stages, as I said, can be accorded and endorsed by the particular hadith that I've mentioned in that instance. And we really want to move our brothers and sisters who have been um, affected by this cultism to the f final two stages, the adult and mature stage, to move them away from this overzealousness where in the founding and youthful phase, you're just being taught about warnings, refutation, you split from individuals, you've got this constipated look about you when you walk into a room and you see individuals, you've got this, this glazed, wild look, you can tell that this individual may be from Maktaba Salafia or this particular cult. Moving on, we'll revisit the advice that was endorsed by Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas, Hafizahullah. And like I did on the last occasion, I will only speak and summarize what is um, said here. So one of the points, the cult, or these type of, this new methodology, or methodologies that have arisen under the banner of Salafia, these particular cults only take from selected scholars and abandon others. And it reads here, you will find some others approving of taking knowledge only from those people of knowledge who are from Arab countries and not from others. This, this is not me saying it. I alluded to that when I spoke about the racism I saw with non-Arab scholars from some of us. Um, and I'm not just a cult, but some of us are Salafis. And it's an unfortunate affair that needs to be addressed. So you'll see that them having, having preference for um, the Arab scholars, um, and it's something that needs to be addressed. Attacking scholars and people of knowledge. So this is something we know that they've done. It's there, it's on their website, um, belittling of scholars and um, students of knowledge. And one thing I'll stop and pause on here at the moment as well, I want to know where it came from, where scholars were denigrated or their students. So where before they were referred to as Sheikh such and such, they're now just Ahmed, Ali, and such. Where did that come from? Now, if some are going to say we're emulating the scholars, the scholars are at a totally different and superior level to us. A totally different and superior level to us. If we hear our, our fathers talking to one of their brothers, one of our uncles, and he speaks about a, a third uncle in a, a derogatory manner, are we going to then start speaking about that uncle in that particular way? I don't think so. And this is just me saying it. Some are going to say, where is he coming from? Because what this cult do, they look to pick at every fault and see if they can exploit it. Go ahead. Go ahead and do that. So then they attack Salafis in the name of Salafia. And they attack the people of knowledge amongst them in the name of, quote, connecting the people with the scholars, unquote. We also see from this group, this cult, that they cut and paste statements and twist them to distort their meanings. We also see taklid, blind following of personalities. It's absolutely amazing that we can see reference to the leaders of this cult, but not the scholar. And even above the scholar, reference to the Quran, the Quran or Sunnah. Ayat wa ahadith. With the right context, of course, of course, not 
not cutting and pasting as I've just mentioned. We also see from this cult, testing people with individuals who are not from the scholars of the Sunnah. We also see from these individuals and this cult, them wasting precious time. As the paper here says, again, approved by Sheikh Wasiyala Abbas Hafidahullah, you will find the people of this group spending all or most of their time in speaking about or against groups and individuals to the exclusion of seeking beneficial knowledge or engaging in worship. This shows their lack of seriousness towards correcting their own selves and preparing for the meeting with their Lord. Is that clear? That's another clear indicator regarding this particular cult. And we're continue. We're continue with descriptions, characteristics of this cult. And this particular paper, the last one I repeat again, was endorsed by Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas. This one was prepared by Sheikh Saleh Al Abdelaziz Al Sheikh. And I'll mention who it was directed to in a moment, because again, it's very interesting who it's directed to, but I want you to listen to the behavioral characteristics. Ignorance. This is one of the characteristics. Anyone who has a false sense of religious eagerness or fervor, remember the first two stages I spoke about in my theoretical framework? Eagerness or fervor that's undisciplined, he will begin to act upon ignorance that could lead to engaging in such tribulations. The famous scholar Ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah, said it well when he wrote in a famous poem Ignorance is a destructive sickness. It's medicine, two things in harmonious order. A text from the Quran or from the Sunnah, its doctor, a devout, trustworthy scholar. So, if the book and the Sunnah is the remedy, then its application and understanding should come from a sincere and trustworthy scholar, not just from anyone, and not an intermediary, intermediary between you and the scholar. Not a cult personality who will tell you, like we saw in the Jim Jones tragedy in, tragedy in Guyana in the 70s, that the person became an intermediary between them and, as he said, God. And no, we're not deifying our scholars at all. This is another example, because you know the cult, they like to twist things. They only hear things selectively, such is their mentality. I repeat what I'm saying, that a sincere, trustworthy scholar is like the doctor. And we should not have an intermediary who puts him or herself up as that bridge between you and the scholar. That is not something that should take place. It's detrimental, it's disastrous, and we're seeing the effects of it because that personality then starts referring to him, himself and his colleagues. And we only have to look at conferences that have taken place over the years. You have scholars going to one conference, dare I say, Green Lane Mosque, and I'm not talking about Green Lane Mosque, I don't know the ins and outs regarding Green Lane Mosque, Small Heath, I'm talking about the attendees, the scholars who come to attend, the bona fide scholars who come to attend. And then we look just down the road and we see the same age old names of cult personalities and their speakers without scholars, without scholars there. But there may be a sort of carrot there to say such and such a live link up's going to come or before it used to be such and such scholars have been invited very good market employee i trust that some of it was sincere and efforts were made but what you do see year in year out are those personalities that are lined up to uh, aligned and lined up to deliver these lectures and i'll refer back to uh my brother dr abdulillah lahmami as well and you have to ask yourself about your status in this cult because you have a PhD and there's respect to you for that. OK, whatever science it was in, there is respect that needs to be afforded. How is it that your name as the doctor and there are no other doctors on there unless uh, Abu Iyad, Dr. Amjad is speaking and he very rarely speaks. He's a prolific writer, mashallah. Unless there's another doctor or a sheikh who should obviously be the one at the top, they should precede, precede everyone. Why is it that your name is last at the bottom of every list and those who are above you have not studied to the degree that you have studied? You need to ask yourself that, Dr. Abdulillah Lahmami. Carrying on with the characteristics from the paper 
of Sheikh Saleh Abdulaziz al Sheikh. The love of worldly life and leadership. The love of worldly life and leadership. And I won't read through all of this here, but suffice it to cover this part. Ibn Taymiyyah said that anyone, whether from the Khawarij or not, that leaves the obedience and allegiance to the legitimate leader, government, president, authority, etc., it is only an inner love for worldly affairs and leadership that leads him to that. He then uses some religious issues or even his enthusiasm for imposing Islamic law and uses that as an excuse to fulfill his inner desires. Like what we heard from our brother Shadid Muhammad, brothers traveling to America, marrying the sisters, tasting, traveling back to the UK and leaving the sisters in a state of suspense or divorce because your Nia was to divorce them, but they didn't know that. And that's not my realm. I'm only um, narrating from an individual that I respect. I don't know him, but I respect what Shadid has said. And I heard this on many other accounts, not only in America, but in the West Indies as well. Moving on with the next characteristic, opposing the scholars and not referring back to them. Now, they will say, we do refer to the scholars. We do refer to the scholars. You refer to a specific set of scholars. And I'm going to touch upon something very sensitive here. If there's a conflict of interest with scholars because they have been involved in business deals and transactions with you, or you are fighting their fight for them against other um, scholars in um, the, the Arab world, or you are conveying the dawah that they want you to convey specifically. Those scholars, with all due respect to our scholars, and if they make a mistake, we know they get one reward. With us, it's a sin. But with all due respect, how is it that they will hear anything against you after you've got yourself so close to them? In some instances, married into their families. I'm asking that question to you, the cult. I'm asking you that question. When you've got business transactions with a sheikh in America, you've got a hajj business with a sheikh coming from the UK, and you've widened your net. Mashallah, does the sheikh know that you've widened your pool, your marketing pool, that you're now bringing Barovis and Diabundis because of the financial revenue that can be generated? I don't understand how that works. And I, I would want something with Dean, Dean references from you to say how that works. Because from where many are standing and looking, there is an issue there. So opposing the scholars and not referring back to them. You do do that to an extent. Because when something comes against you from other Mashiach, you'll either go to Shiyuk that you know to get something counter, or you'll try and bury that thing. And reading from this paper up under this subsection. So one reason for the appearance of tribulations and for a person directly causing, the, causing them is that a person remains firm on his own understanding without referring to the people of knowledge, those who are grounded in it. It is not the case that anyone who simply reads becomes a scholar. I'll repeat that. It is not the case that anyone who simply reads becomes a scholar. Just like anyone who searches for evidence does not automatically become a researcher or someone of knowledge. Uh, Dr. Amjad, just coming back at a tangent to you on this, did you see that, that just because someone researches, so you may research complementary alternative medicine, but that does not make you a doctor or one who can advise cancer patients and other serious illnesses. So that's here. You like to bring things and run them parallel and, and diffuse them with Dean like we all do. Here's something for you on that. Religious knowledge has specialized people that are to be referred back to and consulted with. Therefore, it must be known that one of the causes of tribulations is opposing the scholars and never consulting those who are firmly grounded in religious knowledge. So, I'll move off from that paper from Sheikh Abdulaziz al Sheikh, nearly drawing to a conclusion. I want to refer to something that came from our doctor. Muhammad al Jibali in 2004. And may Allah preserve him and prove, improve his present condition, I mean, because he's not very well at the moment and he's transported from Medina to the US. And Dr. Muhammad al Jibali knows the 
reality of this cult very well and saw it many, many years ago as well. So some of the points that Dr. Jabali discusses from 2004, exposing the imposter Salafis. These are his words. One, our ulama called to cooperation while the imposter Salafis called to dissension and splitting basically. Two, our ulama called to love and good manners, while the imposter Salafis called to hatred and propagate ill manners. Again, behavioral extremism, let's look at the traits. Let's look at what's happening since I've said, put out the discourses I've put out. Let's look at the recent tweets and things that have gone out concerning Abu Alia, Lamont Battle, against Shadid Muhammad, against other individuals. I don't know all of these individuals, mashallah, tabarakallah, but the individuals I do know, the slander and things that are coming out using the deen. So hatred and propagation of ill manners. Brothers, sisters, just look at it. You just have to look. I'm not making this up. I'm reading from Dr. Jibali. I've read other things from cultism and what Shuyuk have said and um, academic research that's been aligned and in, intertwined with what is there from the deen. Just look at the traits, the sifat. So they call to hatred and propagate ill manners. Our ulama call to knowledge, while in the, the imposter Salafis call to ignorance. Our ulama call to forgiveness and compassion, while the imposter Salafis call to cruelty and condemnation. Our ulama call to truthfulness, while the imposter Salafis spread lies. Our ulama call to openness, while the imposter Salafis call to hezbiyah, I would say cultism. Our ulama call to unity and brotherhood, while the imposter Salafis call to racism. And we've discussed aspects of inherent racism already. Now, let's be very clear here, because this cult will twist what has been said here and run to the ulama that they go to and say, they're calling you imposter Salafis. Allah is a witness now, and I'll say it clearly, that I'm referring to the cult and the cult leaders and I said it earlier on, and I will reiterate now, this does not include the scholars. The scholars they refer to or any other. It does not refer to the scholars. It refers to the heads who reside in the UK and in the West. This is who I am referring to. So I'll conclude on that point, and I want to revisit just a final aspect now with Dr. Amjad. Abu Iyad. Going back to social sciences, you wrote a very informative paper a while ago, okay? You wrote it with Tom and Lucinda Richardson at Wilberks Farm. This is version 1.1, called Natural Living Raw Milk, okay? And it's quite a good, it's a two-page two um, paper. I haven't read it in details. I've looked at some of the subheadings, quite interesting. But you yourself then referred to Henry McNutt, his book of 1917 called The Modern Milk Problem. You also referred to Dr. Charles Porter and his observations regarding milk, um, unpasteurized milk, um, regarding asthma. So remember I mentioned to you before, I mentioned it in the last recording, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. OK, so you need to backtrack and really check yourself before you come out with your venomous attacks and your pages and pages of diatribe. Quoting here and there and statements and Kutubi and this and Ikwani and, and th is this all you can do? You, we, we know about regurgitated milk and we know what regurgitated milk turns into. We know as well, Dr. Amjad, that on average, a cow has four teats to its udder. So your study on milk, unpasteurized milk, is your specialism that you looked at and you've transferred that into this alternative, complementary, prophetic medicine um, line and the business that you are now promoting with your cousin in law, your cousin in law. Fine, you want to go down that line and you want to do that. But my advice, if I can offer, any advice to you at this particular juncture 
is that, as I said, a cow, which you would know about from studying milk, ordinarily has four teats to its udder. Could be more, but on average, there are four. So you know about milk in that regard. Salafia is one. Salafia is one. Not these typologies that we're seeing from non-Western, um, non-Muslim academics and everyone talking about the three typologies. And, no, Salafia is one. That's, that's one thing I think all of us as Salafis can agree on. So I would say to you and the cult that you belong to, you've quite literally milked things from your PhD studies regarding cows. And you've also milked the unsuspecting Salafi community, metaphorically speaking. There's not one, there's not, there are not four teats to Salafia. There's just one Salafia. So my advice and my conclusive statement, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing any more because I haven't got time to waste with, with yourselves. You've clearly milked it because your financial revenue is enough for you to be sitting at home writing, 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 writing discourses and pages and pages and sitting in your small room, a keyboard warrior, warrior, warrior as well, keyboard warrior and keyboard warrior. You must be, if we were to depict you in imagery, you'd be like 10 foot tall because of the amount of prolific writing that you do. You've clearly, the revenue that you and your cousin-in-law and the paperwork that only three of you sign and own property and finances on, I've seen it, mashallah tabarakallah, you're clearly milking it, metaphorically speaking. Stop milking Salafia. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika, shadu an la ilaha la ant, stop from kuatu wa ilayk.